How many of you have a copy of the Word of God with you this evening? All right, if you do, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 to begin with. We will move around a little bit tonight. We had finished our doctrinal study last week, and uh, we have a couple weeks before we begin our summer psalms. And so uh, tonight we're just kind of uh, looking at, actually I'll, I'll warn you, uh, This what we're doing tonight is a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, this is a spin-off of a short devotion I did Monday night for basketball, and after finishing, I like I really would like to develop that a little more, and so I've been doing that today. And uh, right before I came in, I thought, Lord, I'd really like to develop that a little more. Uh, so we're going to go ahead, and uh, who knows where this will take us? Uh, I'm not quite sure I know where this will take us, but uh, we are going to show a, c- a couple short videos uh, tonight, which is not something we do often, but I believe it'll be helpful as we come into the Word and helpful to cause us to think a little bit, which is always a good thing uh, for us to think. And so let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we are uh, so thankful just to be able to gather in your house uh, for a, a service where we gather and uh, just bring our request before you. We're thankful that you hear and, and answer prayers. As the testimonies have went up this evening, Lord, uh, many we've heard who have acknowledged that you uh, have answered. And Lord, sometimes you answer in ways that we don't always fully understand or maybe we don't even like, and yet we know that you're in control and, and you're sovereign over all things. And I'm thankful that we can bring uh, all our requests uh, before you, knowing that you care for us. And you tell us, Lord, that um, you desire to bear our burdens. And Father, I, I pray for those uh, who would love to be here tonight and cannot be, for those who are home, who are dealing with sickness and Lord, we think of each one, and Father, you know their needs and their hearts. We pray that you might just work in their life in, in a special way, that they would experience your grace, uh, Lord, um, that you might encourage them, not only physically, but spiritually. And I'm thankful that we can come and sing your praises. And Lord, lift our voices. As we sing, we follow in the line of your people who have always express their love and their joy and their devotion to you through song. And I pray that we could sing uh, with the intensity and the devotion that those uh, those who sang that old spiritual, I shall not be moved, and, and mean that we would stand firmly on you and on your truth in a world that has moved far away from you. I pray that we can truly trust you and trust you more that you would be our vision, that our eyes would always be upon you. You are our wisdom and our riches and our treasure and our hope. We have nothing apart from you. We thank you tonight for the person and work of Christ, how you opened our eyes to see our need, and for, for those who perhaps would be in our midst tonight who do not yet know you, who have not come to saving faith, we pray, Father, that you would work in their heart, that you might draw them to yourself as only you can. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you would make me a vessel fit for your use, and that your word would go forth clearly and plainly, that it might touch our hearts in a way that would bring honor and glory to your name. We pray and we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, and amen. We're actually going to start with one of those videos right off the bat. Uh, This is uh, actually a a poem uh, written by a man named Taylor Molly. And uh, they're going to pull it up there on the screen. It's called Totally Like Whatever You Know. And I was going to try and read it, but I cannot do it justice. So we're going to let him do it for us. And you can go ahead. Give it up for my man, Taylor Molly. In case you hadn't realized, it has somehow become uncool to sound like you know what you're talking about. (laughs) Or believe strongly in what you're, like, saying. (laughs) 
invisible question marks and parenthetical you knows and you know what I'm saying? I've been attaching themselves to the ends of our sentences, even when those sentences aren't, like, questions. <laughs> Declarative sentences, so-called because they used to, like, you know, declare things to be true, okay? As opposed to other things that are, like, totally, you know, not. <laughs> They've been infected by this tragically cool and totally hip interrogative tone. As if I'm saying, don't think I'm a nerd just because I've like noticed this, okay? I have nothing personally invested in my own opinions. I'm just like inviting you to join me on the bandwagon of my own uncertainty. <laughs> What has happened to our conviction? Where are the limbs out on which we once walked? Have they been like chopped down with the rest of the rainforest? You know? Or do we have like nothing to say? Has society just become so filled with these conflicting feelings of yeah? that we've just gotten to the point where we're the most aggressively inarticulate generation to come along since, you know, a long time ago. So I implore you, I entreat you, and I challenge you to speak with conviction. To say what you believe in a manner that bespeaks the determination with which you believe it. Because contrary to the wisdom of the bumper sticker, it is not enough these days to simply question authority. You gotta speak with it, too. I know there's, I know there's a lot of laughing and joking yeah, as, as he shares that, again, I could have never read that in the, in the way that he did. But I believe that he makes a valid point about the condition of our culture. Uh, we are very uncertain uh, culturally. Uh, we do not, we, we, we simply aren't sure. <laughs> and you, you might say, well, what about what? Well, we're not sure about anything. You know, we, we live in a culture uh, where we... There's no absolutes. Um, you know, our, our, I, I was thinking about this. To, you know, our, our children have questions. They, ha they have big questions, important questions, and we don't have answers. Not any answers with any substance. Right? He, he, he says, you know, where is our conviction? And, and that's the question. You know, when I say we live in a world with no absolutes, that's particularly true when it comes to moral issues. You know, when it comes to areas of morality, we... As a culture, we say that it's subjective. It's relative. When I say relative, I mean that what's true for you may not necessarily be true for me, and vice versa. So I can believe something is wrong, and you can believe it's right, and that's okay. Right? That's okay. You know, there's no absolute truth. We tend to put moral truth um, on the same level as as ice cream, you know, uh, we can, you, you, I can say vanilla is, it, it doesn't taste good. Well, that's a matter of opinion, right? It's subjective, right? My daughter loves vanilla, eh, you know? But when it comes to moral truth, we've, we've placed it in the same category, category as ice cream, where we say, this is wrong, and somebody else will say, eh, now, not, not so sure about that. It's subjective, and so we can have as many rights and wrongs as there are people who believe them. Now, we don't believe that, do we? We don't believe that right and wrong are subjective. We do believe that there is an absolute truth. And yet... Do we live like it? I fear, 
I fear that we have fallen into the category of the inarticulate generation, that we have jumped on the bandwagon of uncertainty as the people of God. And we can't allow it to continue. And so this is where we're going to flow from. I had you turn to 2 Timothy 3 just to paint the picture. Right? 2 Timothy 3, I'm going to read. I'm not going to try not to comment too much. 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. You hear that? Never able to arrive. This is the culture that we live in, is it not? We cannot arrive at truth. We're in the last days. This is where we're at. Right? This is the culture that we live in. And you know, the response, the Christian response to this has by and large been silence. We have failed to speak either because we're uncertain or because we're too concerned about what others may think about us if we disagree with them. Because if there's anything that's wrong today, it's what? It's to say that something's wrong. Now, you might think, this doesn't really matter. It's not that important, right? It's not, it's not a big deal. But if you believe that, uh, they're going to pull up our next video, all right? I'm going to try and get these out of the way here so we can focus on the Word. If you believe that, then, then watch, this is, this is happening at a college campus in the United States not that long ago. And, and the video deals with, you know, I, I, I want to be careful here. I mean, we're being videotaped, and it deals with the, the bathroom, the whole gender identity issue. Uh, so, but I want you to see the thought process, all right, of, what's, uh, of what people think, of what people believe on our college campuses around the country. So go ahead and play that one, Scott. In light of all the conversation about gender and identity, we began to wonder if there's even a difference between men and women anymore. We went to Seattle University to find out. I'm aware of the conversation going on in Washington State right now around kind of gender identity, gender expression issues, and the ability to access facilities on those grounds? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, you know, there's, there's general neutral bathrooms in like all the dorms and stuff like that. I think that gender is fluid, so if you want to use a bathroom because that's a place and that's a space where you feel comfortable and safe in doing so, then I think that that's completely fine. I think that if whoever you think you are, if you're male or female, then that's the bathroom you should go into. I think if it doesn't really negatively affect anybody, then I think anyone be, should be able to choose what gender they uh, choose to identify as. People, no matter what their gender identification is, they should be allowed to use whatever restrooms they should they, they feel like they identify with. Is there a difference in your mind between men and women? Um, no, yes. I mean, um, possibly? In general, yes. But I don't know why I think that. Socially, currently, yes, there is. There is no need for that difference to exist. Uh, scientifically and logically. If you think that you're a male, if you think that you're a female, that matters more than the biological difference. There's not much difference besides what society forces onto people. And how do you know the difference between men and women? By what people think they are. So you can't like judge someone just on like their looks. I don't think there's any one way to really distinguish between a man or a woman, and I don't think it's necessary. Uh, it's not always consistent. It has a high probability, like 98% of the time, I can get it right. There is some ambiguity. I think, yeah, there are ways to tell, but then again, you can always be wrong. What would you say I am? Just judging off of your looks, I would say that you're a male. I would probably assume a man, but then you never know. A male. Why would you say that? Based on how I look at you. <laughs> 
Do you think that's a problem? Yeah, probably. Do you think the difference between men and women matters for any reason? Uh, no, not really. I think most sociologists agree that uh, the concept of gender is more of a societal construct. I do think it matters somewhat, yeah. To me, no. I don't, I don't feel as if it matters to me because uh, at the end of the day, the person is just a person. No, I don't think it should matter. And the differences on a uh, social level are simply a product of a biased society. Then is there a reason to have those labels, male or female? I don't think so. I think that it's, again, a social construct of this binary that we're given at birth. There is kind of a difference, but at the same time, if someone wants to identify as one or both or as nothing, I also find that completely okay. And There may be nothing more self-evident in the natural universe than the fact that every animal species is divided into two halves, male and female. Yet the most intelligent of those species seems to be wrestling with whether male or female are actually real things. Have we discovered something new, or have we become too clever for our own good? Sometimes when I call a lady sir by accident, they get very offended. <laughs> and I knew that's the reaction I would get in here. Sure. And I, I think, you know, if you couldn't hear her, she was just saying she was thankful that her kids hadn't went to a traditional university. You know, and, and, you know, that's, I think it brings up a valid point, at least for parents, and we have a lot of parents in here. We have to seriously consider how we're going to educate our children. I mean, we have to, as parents, we have to think that. We have to consider carefully because clearly this is not, you know, that, that's not a, a minority. That's a state. That's a state college. It's a state institution. It's not a private Ivy League, you know, <laughs> ivory tower type of thinking. Uh, that type of thinking that we're we find amusing is prevalent in our culture. Joanne. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, and and they're they're in again. And you know, you're talking about a, a very small minority of people, right? And and I I didn't pick this. I mean, I know it's a hot button issue right now. I didn't pick this so we could necessarily pick on that particular issue. I think it brings out the point that we as a culture are very confused. We're very confused. Uh, to me. That particular issue is, is pretty black and white, right? And yet, and, and, and I, you know, I can tell by the reaction that most of you would agree with that. And yet it's not so black and white out there. Right? Not, not black and white at all. And, you know, I would love to talk to some of those, you know, is there a need biologically for male and female for the continuation of the species? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, we can't wipe away these, you know, these distinctions. They, they exist for a reason and a purpose, and um, oh my! But if, if you if you want to, they have another they have another video they put out that we're not going to take time to watch tonight. And that same and the same guy's asking him about you know, whether he could be a six five Chinese woman, right? And the, the thing that stands out is is you notice even when he said you know well you know what am I? And they said a man. They said it apologetically, you know like oh, you know, is it okay for me to say that? That you're a man, you know, I probably shouldn't say that. They're, I mean, that's why it's so black and white, right? God made them male and female. We go back to Genesis 1. We, we rest on this truth, right? And that's the problem, right? And this is not a new problem. We, we kind of look at this and think, man, our society is off its rockers, but it's not new. You know, when Jesus was standing before Pilate in John chapter 18, 
you know, I'll, I'll read it so I don't mess it up. John 18, beginning in verse 37, Jesus said, For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Right, so Jesus makes it very clear. I've come to witness, to, to give testimony to the truth. So there is truth, according to Jesus. And Pilate looks at him and says, what is truth? What is truth? That's, that's the culture that we live in. Nothing new, right? Nothing new under the sun. The, the culture that we live in is no different than the Roman culture that Jesus was dealing with in that time. Is there a truth? Can we be certain? Can we be sure? And so what I want to do, I guess, is trying to define that to start with. What is truth? You know, the Oxford Dictionary says it's the quality or state of being true, uh, that which is true or, or in accordance with fact or reality. Right? That's, that's the dictionary definition, right? In accordance with fact or reality. So are there facts? Is there certain truths? Are there absolutes? And if there is, <laughs> then, then we've got to give way to this subjective mindset, right? If there's absolute truth. Now, f I'm going to argue from the scripture here, right? So, number one, we would say that God is the source of truth. God is the source of truth. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 16, he is identified as the God of truth truth, right? The God of truth, right? And, and, and this is good news for us as his people, right? So that which is fact, that which is certain, that which can be counted upon, that which does not change or, you know, God is a God of truth, which means that he's a rock that we can stand upon. We need that, don't we? We live in a culture that's changing and ever changing and cannot be counted upon, but we have a God who is truth. Isaiah 45, 19 I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Now, that's, that's a very straightforward, narrow-minded statement, right? I, God, speak the truth. I declare what is right. So, along with that truth, there's an authority that comes along with that. And that's what's missing, right? That's what's missing from our culture is this conviction and this clarity that we see in the scripture god is the source of truth jesus you know god the son john 14 6 i am the way the truth and the life right very clear truth claim right <laughs> there are not many truths there's only one truth right not not many competing truths. Not many ways. There's only one way. There's only one life. And I am that truth. The Holy Spirit. John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. Right? So we see that God, this triune God, is a God of truth. He speaks truth. And He speaks with authority. Now, not only do we have a God of truth, but we have a God who has revealed himself and spoken that truth, right? We have this written word of God. John 17, 17, thy word is truth, right? Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and verse 160, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures. The sum of your word, right? So, what we hold in our hand here is truth, right? So this is where we stand. This is what we stand upon. And so John MacArthur, in his book, The Truth War, he, he gives a definition for truth that lines up with what we see reflected here in the Scripture, that God is the source of truth, and he's revealed himself in his word. So he would say this, truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. Simply to the point, 
Truth is the self-expression of God. All right, so God is the source, right? He's the source of truth. And that means that it comes down with a very strict authority. Right? So we can't take the truth that flows down from God and say, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. We would say what? No, God has spoken. Right? God made them male and female. We would say, okay. Right? That's, what we, that, that's black and white, right? And, and we can do that with all other you know, sin, right, wrong. God has said, okay, right? Very black and white. And yet, Proverbs 6, 20, 16, 25 says what? There's a way that seems right to a man. And the, end of the, and, and the end thereof is the way of death. So rejection of truth has serious ramifications. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal to hear what God has revealed and to reject it. Right? And, and we see this, we see it in Romans chapter 1 for certain, right? The wrath of God is revealed, Romans 1.18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Right, now that goes on to say, you know, we know there's a God. All creation knows there's a God. You know, by, by what he has made, right? And it's inherent in us. God has placed within us a, you know, a conscience that we know right from wrong. And so what we see happening by and large, as we see men, what? Suppressing the truth that they know. And that's what we see happening there on the screen, right? Is it important? Does it matter? I don't know. They're suppressing the truth. And it's a big deal. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Verses 10 through 12, it says, With all the wicked deception for those who are perishing... Why are they perishing? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Verse 12, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Those who are perishing, those who are condemned, why? Because they did not believe the truth. Serious, eternal ramifications for those who reject the truth, those who suppress the truth. And so here's the question then for us in our culture that is so uncertain. What do we do? What do we do in a culture where truth is subjective? We don't have a lot of time left, so let's just maybe think through this. Right. I, I think of, I think of uh, Ephesians 4. You have 14 where he says, I don't want you to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. Right? So there's a, there's a concern tossed to and fro by the waves. There's a concern for the people of God, for the church of God, that they're going to be tossed to and fro, right? That they're going to be wrapped up in different teachings, different. So there's a danger for us as the church to fall into fall into this bandwagon of uncertainty. There's a danger for us to be tossed back and forth. And it's happening. It, 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 you, could, you could ruin your day by going into some message boards, right, that, that are commenting on these different videos or blogs, just reading down through about people who would profess the name of Christ who would say, I can't believe all you Christians, you're, you're, you're hating and you're, you're such bigots. Where's all the, you know, where's the love? Where's the... You would, you would just be amazed the amount of people who call themselves Christians who would say, this is okay, and this is okay, and this is okay. Even though God's word clearly says, it's not okay. And so there's a danger for the people of God to be tossed to and fro. And, and, and instead of that, what does he say? He says, rather speak the truth. Now, a lot of Christians stop there, which is why, why we have the hate and the bigoted name, right? Because we don't just speak the truth. We speak the truth in love. We speak the truth in love. Somehow, somehow speaking the truth has been equated with hate, right? Some of that may be justified, 
And, and I certainly want to say that for those who may be watching online, you know, the fact that I'm bringing up this issue of gender identity, and if that's something you're struggling with, or I, I want you to, to know that we don't hate. Right? We, we, believe, we believe in black and white. We believe in absolute truth. We believe there's, that God made male and female, but we don't hate. So I don't know where along the line where to disagree with someone meant that you hated them. It is a far more hateful thing to let someone live in their error than to correct them in love. Because to reject the truth has serious eternal ramifications. To reject who you are, right, who you are created by God in his image as male or female has serious ramifications. You're rejecting truth. Ultimately, you reject truth in a totality. Which means that you will die in your sin and be separated from God for all eternity in hell. The most loving thing to do is to say, hey, let's talk about this. We do disagree. Let me show you why. And so we need to speak, and we need to speak with clarity, and we need to speak with conviction. I wish you had more time for this. (laughs) Colossians chapter 2 warns us about getting caught up in different philosophies and, and different teachings. He says, make sure you're grounded in the truth. So what do we do? Well, we speak, but we, if we're going to speak and we're going to speak the truth, then we've got to know the truth. So that means we've got to ground ourselves in this truth. And I'm going to tell you what, we need to ground our children, our family, in the truth. <laughs> Although I think my three-year-old has a better grasp on this than those college students. I mean, we were just asking the question, or, you know, what it, <laughs> and, and my three-year-old goes, well, well I'm a girl. He's a boy, you know. They know this, right? They know this. It's just a social construct. (laughs) That's what we've taught them. (laughs) There's a clear difference. But we need to be careful because they're being taught something very different. So we've got to be grounded in this truth, rooted and built up in it. And the the great example of this is Christ himself. People always point to Jesus and say, well, Jesus loved everybody, and he did. But he wasn't shy about speaking the truth. You know, look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, but I say. Six times. You have heard it said, but I say. He was correcting their understanding. Let me tell you what is the truth. What about, what about the Samaritan woman? John chapter 4, right? <laughs> Where's your husband? I don't have a husband. <laughs> you're right, right? You've had five husbands. The man you're with now is not your husband, right? What does he do? He calls her out on her sin. How dare he? How judgmental of Jesus. What was he doing? He was dealing with, he was lovingly correcting her sin. Right? Which we have to deal with before we come to him. We must recognize our sinful condition before we come to Christ. And so we look at the example of Christ himself. And you know, it, it's fascinating to me when you, come, when you come to the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has spoken with such strong, strong words. You have heard it said, but I say. Right? <laughs> um, Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Well, that's very narrow-minded. You know, or you, know, you shall know them by their fruit. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, again and again, making these strong statements. And when he's finished, in verse 28, it says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished. At his teaching. Why? Why were they so astonished? Because he was teaching as one who had authority. And not as the scribes. 
You know what our culture needs? They need men and women who will speak with conviction and truth according to the authority of the word of God. It's not going to be popular. And I'm not telling you to, to go out and beat somebody over the head with the Bible. I'm telling you that we need to speak the truth in love. In love. I know you might say, well, the culture is too far gone. Well, the person you're ministering to may not be too far gone. They need to hear the truth. Because the rejection of the truth is the difference between life and death. Jesus alone is. And, and, and so, I told you, I'm not sure where I'm going here. I gotta, I, we're going a lot of places at once. Parents, ground yourself in the truth. And consider carefully how you're going to ground your children in the truth. Because our public schools and institutions are working hard to ingrain in them something very different than what we believe. And as a church, our call is clear. Let us stand firmly on the truth. On the truth of the word of God on who he is, on what he's done, and let us speak boldly and with clarity. And we'll, we'll close with that tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, uh, it's always hard when we see, we see those who are so blinded to the truth. who have rejected you and apart from apart from true saving faith they will experience your wrath Lord your word says the truth will set them free I pray for us as a church that we would be grounded and rooted in your truth but Lord let us not let us not rest in that. Let us speak it boldly, firmly, standing upon the authority of your word. I pray for our children that are growing up in this culture. Father, I ask that you would guard and protect their minds and their hearts. I pray for wisdom for us as parents, as grandparents, that you would help us to lead them in the way that is everlasting. May we be a light in the darkness, Father, we pray and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.